If there's one thing Big Tree Tech excels at, that is releasing 3D printer mainboards. And today we're going to take a look at another one. This is the SKR2. Hello everyone, Chris here, and yes, Big Tree Tech has released the next rendition in the SKR series, the SKR2. And we're going to do the usual, look over the board, see what the new features are, get it installed, and give it a test. But the SKR2 had kind of a rocky release. There were some issues when they first released it, and they tried to pull as many of the boards back and get the revision B out to all the users. And they did a fair job at trying to mitigate all these issues with that bad board, the revision A board. So before we get started with this video, let's talk about what happened with the SKR2. So here's the SKR2. Now the issue that they had with these boards was actually a feature that they were trying to introduce to help you out. And that's with this MOSFET right here. Now the point of this is so you can install the drivers either way. If you had to flip one around, like you got it wrong on accident, this would protect you from ruining that driver. Now with these boards, depending on the driver you have, that's actually kind of hard to do. But that's a nice feature, a nice thought that it would save your drivers if you got it flipped around. But because the wrong component got used when they put those MOSFETs on, it was causing problems and destroying some of the drivers. I think the most common one was the 2209. It wouldn't tolerate it. Now, you can fix that issue. You can ground out several of these pins. You can tie them down to the ground on the board if you wanted to. But Big Tree Tech is offering full refunds for these boards. So if you have a revision A board, just get rid of it, don't use it. I wouldn't bother with it, just in case you got confused down the line. I'll leave some information in the description on how you could fix it and the information if you need to return one. But how do you know if you had a bad one? Well, the easiest way is to just flip the board over. On all the boards with a bad MOSFET, you just have this green QC sticker. On the Revision B boards, the ones that operate correctly, you should have the green sticker as well as a chrome sticker. Also, the MOSFETs that are good, the ones that don't have issues, are all the same model number. The one on the Revision A board that I have is this MOSFET here. It's a G090N06, but it could be multiple components. It might be different from this one, but this is the bad board. And all of the good boards should have an HY1904 on them. As far as I know, they're all this model of MOSFET. You should be good to go here. Again, Big Tree Tech offers a couple of different scenarios where you can replace the MOSFET. There should be some extra parts. You can ground it out. There's a bunch of different fixes, but again, I would just have it replaced, just so you don't have any questions down the line. So in general, that's what happened. And again, I don't like to have one-off configurations like this laying around because eventually I'll get back to that and then wonder why I did what I did to resolve that issue. So personally, I would just rather have it replaced. But you can go whichever direction you like. I will leave a link to all that information in the description below. But make sure you get your Revision B board, or at least you get it updated so it will work correctly, no matter what driver you use. Now with all that said, let's move to the features that are on the SKR2 and take a look back at the SKR series. We have gone through a 1.1, a 1.3, and a 1.4, and I do believe the SKR2 has the best set of features going forward. Now let's talk a little bit about the evolution of the SKR boards. Now, this is a 1.3 board. They did actually have a 1.1 board. It had a few issues, but this is the first one that was actually a really solid board in my opinion. It worked great. It was missing a few features, but I actually prefer the 1.3 over the 1.4 in a certain amount of scenarios. So the big thing about the SKR boards is they had integrated smart driver control. You don't have to jumper things to be able to use SPI or UART interfaces. It's all integrated right in and you can control it with jumpers. And that was great to see, especially on the 1.3 board. Because you could trigger sensorless homing over here with these jumper caps. There's jumper caps underneath all of these drivers where you can use SPI mode. Or you have jumpers out here where you can cap them for UART drivers. Now the 1.3 did lack a few different pins. It didn't have as many exposed servo pins as I would like to see. There was a few other things like dedicated probe pins that you might want that 1.3 didn't have. But 
It is a pretty solid board. I like being able to use those jumper caps. Also, there was only one port for your Z motor. Even though that would be a parallel connection, those two would be connected together, it would be nice to have two ports. You could always use your extruder one driver two if you'd like. And the 1.3 boards were an LPC 1768 chip. And then we had the 1.4 boards. You could get these in 1.4 and 1.4 turbo. The only difference is the regular one had an LPC 1768 just like the 1.3 and the turbo had an LPC 1769. Now there were a few changes here. You can see these pins up here for diag pins for something like on a 2209. Well, they let you use the pins on the driver to select what mode you were using. So you'd actually have to clip a pin if you didn't want to use centerless homing, or it would interfere with some of these end stop pins down here. Now there were more ports available on these boards, like ports for Wi-Fi. You had dedicated Pro ports, NeoPixels. So there were a few more accessory ports on the 1.4 versions, but it wasn't near as easy to select your driver mode you do get two Z ports on this one in parallel. So in some areas, this was an improvement, but in other areas, I think it's actually a little bit of a downgrade than the 1.3. The one big jump for the 1.4 is it did have a dedicated EEPROM chip where the 1.3, you had to use the SD card. So it did have that going for it. And I do want to mention on the 1.3 and 1.4, you do have blade fuses, which is nice to see. It makes it a lot easier to use. Now we jump to the SKR2. The SKR2 is trying to be the best of both worlds in my opinion. There's a lot of added features that we can go over and we will touch on them. But as far as the downsides from the 1.3 and the 1.4, it's got a mix of both. So the jumpers that you can select your driver settings, they're all here. Just like on the 1.3, you do get the dual ports and all of the extra accessory pins just like on the 1.4 and dedicated EEPROM. So that is a bonus. That was one of the biggest issues that I had in between the 1.3 and 1.4, so they have resolved that. But notice you have these micro fuses down here. Those are a lot harder to get than a regular blade fuse. So they have switched over to that. So note that if you're getting an SKR2. And they have changed up the heater terminals here for E0 and E1. They've put these plugs in, so the wires actually come out of the top. That can be a little handier to install than when they come out of the side, if you have a tight case. Also, they've converted over to a Wi-Fi module set, so you can use something like a 32 module instead of that 8266. So that should give you a lot more options, and be a lot handier if you'd like to run RepRap firmware, which you can on this board. But outside of the comparison, let's go over some of the features. First to note, if you're used to the SKR series, it is the same bolt pattern as the 1.3 and the 1.4, so you don't have to rework your case too much. Do be aware of that SD card slot and this new USB type plug that you can use for storage. This processor, they switch from the LPC format over to STM32. This is an STM32 F407 VGT6. Again, you can interface with an ESP12S or ESP07S module. You can run Marlin and RepRap. They have configurations for both. In my opinion, one of the biggest upgrades for the SKR2 is you get three PWM modulated fans. So you can control all of those in G-code. And then you have two always on ports if you'd like to use them. But that's a big deal. You almost never see three. All these extra pins over here, it's pretty much standard fare, but there are a lot of them. You have ports for servos, probes, PS on, power detect, filament detect, RGB, all the good stuff that 1.4 had and more. And it will support pretty much every driver on the map. 5160, 2209, 2225, 2226, 2208, 2130, even LV8729, 8825s. A4988s, whatever you want to run, this will support them. Of course, with all those driver choices, SPI or UART, or your standalone mode. Again, I mentioned you do get two Z plugs. Of course, you have your TFT pins for your touchscreen, just like all the other boards. And added to this one is the U-Disc, as they like to call it, so you can use a flash drive for your files. 
And on the back, all their badging is very clear, easy to read, just like all the other boards. Everything's good here. PCB is four layers thick. So the SKR2 definitely has a good feature set. There's a lot of improvements, in my opinion, over the 1.3 and 1.4 boards. They finally got a lot of those jumper settings right for the drivers. And that's what we're going to do now. Let's go over how to install different types of drivers on these boards, because that is one of the biggest advantages to the SKR series. They have integrated connections where you can use smart drivers and all their features. All right, now let's get set up to use our drivers. For this build, we are gonna use 2209s, that's pretty common. Those are UART mode. But again, these will handle multiple drivers. So by default, if you have all of these jumpers on underneath the driver, that is SPI mode, something like a 2130 would use. If you use these sets of pins over here, that is step direction mode. That's what Big Tree Tech calls it. I call it standalone mode. That'd be for something like an A4988 or an 8825. Now to use UART mode, we only need this jumper on. So we can go ahead and remove all the other ones. I'll do that now. All the extra jumpers are off, so now we can use UART mode for these 2209s. Now remember I said you had to snip some diag pins on the 1.4 and then you had actual jumpers on the 1.3 to set up centerless homing? Well, SKR2, you have a set of pins right here. I'll lean that up a bit. You can see them right here. They're actually kind of close to that diag pin module. But if you want to use centerless homing, cap these pins. Log here still uses end stop switches, so we're going to leave these open. It is important to note that these pins over here are a lot smaller. They're going to take a smaller jumper than the ones over here. These are about three millimeters apart. These are two and a half. So if you want to use that senseless homing, they give you some of these really small jumpers with the board. But you don't have to do anything now to that driver, clip the pins, anything like that to use senseless homing. You just have to put these caps on. Just be aware it is a different size. All five are on, and I do use this fifth driver because I'm really getting good results out of using that G34 command to level my Z gantry. So I'm plugging in Z in the Z driver and in E1 and then setting it up in firmware. One more thing to be aware of, you do have your jumper over here if you would like to power it up USB. By default, it should be on VDD, so it's only powered by the input power. And you have some jumpers over here to select Wi-Fi and this U driver port. My guess is they are sharing serial, so you probably can't use both. But you can probably get around that in the firmware nowadays because they are offering three different serials. But just be aware of that you can select them with these jumpers. All of this information for the drivers and the board is over on the Big Tree Tech GitHub, link in the description. Now we're gonna walk through step by step plugging all this in. I'm just gonna plug it in here on the table. This is my case for my 1.3 board. Again, it's the same footprint, but I am gonna to have to add a hole for this USB drive port. So I'll get a hole punched in it, get another one printed out, and I'll leave links in the description so you can use this case if you want to. This one is designed to use the stock Prusa case holes. It slides on two screw heads here up against the frame. So we got our drivers installed. I will update that case and leave a link in the description in case you want to print it. Again, it does fit the Prusa style printer. But also I wanted to note that this is my fourth SKR2 board. I had issues with several of these, both revision A and revision B. They all did a few things a little bit differently. On a lot of the Revision B boards, I had problems with SD cards and LCD screens. Big Tree Tech did take care of it, and they finally got me a board that works perfectly. But remember, QC on these boards isn't always the best. But let's go ahead and move to the install, because I do think the SKR2 is worth checking out because of the features that it has. So pretty much this is a standard board install. We're just going to work around and plug things in. But let's talk about fans first because that's really the only thing that's a lot different here. Fan Zero is traditionally your part fan. In the configuration for this board, they are using the pin called PB7, and that is this plug here. It's the one closest to the power input. Also keep in mind, if you have to reconfigure a plug, you have to put a new connector on it. The VCC pin is on this side over here and the controller pin is on this side over here. So for my part fan, 
It'll go right here. Remember that's PB7. Power to the outside of the board. And then I'm going to stick my hot end fan right above it so that I can control it in firmware. This is PB6, so it won't be on all the time. And remember, you have three of these now. So if you have a controller board fan that you want to set based on temperature or whatever you might want to set it to when the motors are energized in the firmware, go ahead and put it back here in PB5, and then you can control it in G-code or firmware. A great upgrade. And then we'll just continue on. The hot end thermistor, right down here. I still like to use my probe on the Z minimum pins. So I don't bother using the probe pins. Most of the time when you configure those probe pins, you enable it to use a Z end stop as well. I don't have a Z end stop, I just use the probe. And I find it much easier just to put it on the Z min pins. If you're gonna use the same type of probe I do, I use a pin to probe. The wiring on a lot of these probes is gonna be the same. You're gonna have brown, blue, and black. On this board down here, this is the signal pin. Up here, that's the five volt pin. So your black wire would go to signal, your brown goes to five volt, just like that. Then we'll plug in our extruder motor right up here to E0 driver. I have a filament runout sensor. We're gonna put it right here on E0 detect. That's the traditional X max pin. And on this board, it's kind of nice because you can pull these connectors off and then we can just screw down our hot end heater. Make sure it's nice and snug, and then we can plug it back in. This first one here is heater zero, this one's heater one. Now on this board, be careful, because these are the heated bed pins to power it up, these are the power end pins, and the polarity is flip-flopped on these. For the heated bed, a lot of times the polarity doesn't matter, but if you have an LED on yours, it will. So pay close attention. For the heated bed, the outside one is ground, inside is voltage. Make sure you get them snugged down as good as you can. And then it's flip-flopped. So for the input power, this side is positive, the inside is negative. I'm gonna hold off on doing that right now because my wires aren't that long. So let's go ahead and plug in our bed thermistor over here. Bed is right there. And let's move to our motors. We have X right up here. And again, I'm using end stop wires. Y next to that. And then my first Z motor, I'm gonna put here on Z. And my second one, I'll put down here on E1 because I wanna be able to use that G34 command to level my gantry right there. And again, I do have in stop switches, so we'll hook those up. I'm just using the micro switches, the two wire ones. So if you have the two wire switches like I do, I have the best luck ground switching them. So you're gonna wanna use the ground pin and the signal pin. For these switches, it doesn't matter which leg. The ground pin is in the center, and then the signal pin is gonna be over here on this side, away from the drivers. So we'll put our X right here, and then the same config for Y right next to it. Ground and signal. I do still have the 2004 display, so we can go ahead and plug in our LCD cables, EXP1, EXP2. Remember, you might have to flip-flop these depending if you're using a Prusa-style screen, even ones from LDO, or the regular 2004. But that should be pretty common nowadays to be able to figure out what screen you need to use. And then finally, we hook up our power wires. Remember, the polarity is flip-flop from bed to power, power in, you have VCC right here, and then ground on that side. Remember these boards do work just fine at 12 volt, which we're doing today, or 24. Shouldn't make a difference. And that's it, now we're ready to power up. We will need to configure some firmware because this is a scratch build. But as far as hardware goes, we should be all set. And I know that hardware install was a complete mess. The wires are everywhere and they desperately need to be switched out on log. Over the years, we've done so many different projects. It's just a hodgepodge of different things. I hope to get them all switched out sometime this year. But this should give you the gist of how to get the board installed. It is pretty self-explanatory. The manual is pretty good as well as the badging on the board, but that should get it done. But now we need some firmware. So let's jump in to configure Marlin. 
All right, here we go. So we are going to configure this from scratch. So as usual, we just head out to marlinfw.org and we're gonna to go to downloads and grab the latest release. Currently, as of this video, it is 2091. That's some patches from 0.9. We're gonna download this zip file. When the download is complete, you will have a zip and then you can right click extract all and then name it something you can remember. I usually just name it the version. It will put a folder inside that folder and then that's the folder that I name after the printer. So here's our working folder. You can open that up. I did rename this one as well. If you go inside this folder, this contains your Marlin folder and all your info. And on this one, I'm just gonna add a tag on it. We're gonna call it log and then the board skr underscore two. And then we can head to VS Code and open it up and start making our changes. Now, if you need to know how to set up VS Code, I did do a video on this recently. Uh, I will leave a link to that in the description. So let's open up VS Code. We're gonna go ahead and add a folder. Just a quick tip, if you have problems with folders, you can always go up here to File, and you can close your workspace. Then we're gonna go ahead and add a folder, head to Downloads, Marlin 291, and then we wanna add the folder that contains the Marlin folder, hit Add. We can expand Marlin, and then we'll start in configuration.h. We're just gonna walk through this step by step. I'll go pretty quickly, but again, I will leave this configuration the link to it in the description if you want to edit it. I will try to explain this as we go. I do have other videos on how to configure Marlin. So let's change the description. We did create it and it's for SKR2 and the log printer. Serial port. I'm not 100% sure how the SKR2 handles this because there are three ports available in Marlin right now. But I'm going to go with my instinct and set this one to negative one, so it allows us to use the USB port. I don't have a TFT screen or Wi-Fi, other options that might run on the serial, so this should be just fine. We'll continue on. 250,000 baud rate, that's fine for us. And then board name. Again, if you need to know the boards, you can go to source over here. Core. Boards. This is an STM32F4. They are grouped by processor. And here is your SKR version 2.0 Rev B. Notice they do have Rev A up here. Marlin has done a good job to try to tell you that you don't want to use that. If you select Rev A, then it's going to say, hey, you might damage your drivers if you use these boards. Get a Rev B. So we're going to copy Rev B. Go back to configuration.h. We'll paste it right here. Moving on. We only have one extruder. We are 1.75 filament. Thermistor settings for the temp sensor on the hot end. This is a V6. I use an E3D thermistor, so that is number five. For the bed, I'm using a number one, a regular 100K thermistor. Max and min temps should be fine. I don't do a lot of high temp filament on this one. Even though it is a V6, you could set it to 300, but we'll take the defaults. PID settings, we will need to tune those. We'll come back and do that after the config. I'm gonna leave all of the end stops to false. This is the setting that will invert it if it's not working correctly. So if it's triggered when it says it's open or vice versa, if it's not acting correctly, this is where you toggle that. Use the M119 to command to troubleshoot it. But for now, we're just gonna set all these to false and we'll test it out later. And if we need to switch it, we can come back. Then we move on to the driver settings. We do have 2209s. So I'm gonna change all these to TMC2209. And even though we have the driver setting in the E1 driver socket, we are using it as a Z2. So we're gonna uncomment the Z2 line and change that to TMC2209. Noise threshold, this is something you can enable if you're having problems with faulty triggering on your end stops. I don't think log needs it, so we'll leave it off for now. Again, we can come back and tweak it if we need to. Default access steps on log, we have 100 for X and Y. We use four start lead screws, so it's 400, and I'm using the Mark III style extruder 
at 16 times micro stepping, so I set it to 140. For the sake of this video, we're just going to take defaults on all the acceleration and feed rates. They should work okay. We can tweak them later. We're going to go with classic jerk, so we're going to uncomment this. If you leave that comment on, it's going to go with junction deviation. I prefer classic jerk because it works better with linear advance. And I'm going to set my jerk values to 8 and 8. 0.3 on Z should be fine. Z probe, Z probe does use Z minimum end stop. I showed you that before. I plugged it into those end stop pins. So that setting's good there. If you have to set it to something different, you're going to want to alter this Z probe pin setting and set it to the Z probe pin that you have it plugged into. If you want to use that probe pin on the board, the five pins in a row, like if you had a BL touch, you would set that to PA10. PA9 is the servo pin for the BL touch. So PA10 would go here. We do have a fixed mounted probe. Take the comment off of that line. If you want to use the BL touch, just uncomment this one and nothing else. And you need to set your probe offsets. Every hot end design is going to be just a little bit different. This is the offset to where the probe is located versus the nozzle. You can use this map up here to help get those settings. Mine is 23 millimeters to the right of the hot end for X and six millimeters in the back, so the back of the nozzle. And currently I set my Z offset to negative 1.1. That takes some dialing in. I usually like to set this with baby stepping, just dial it in via the LCD screen. You can do that however you wish. I have a lot of videos on how to set that up. Probe margin on this bed, I can just set it to zero. I have enough room, it's a steel sheet, so I can probe pretty much anywhere. I don't have to avoid any clips or anything like that. Right here, you can enable multiple probes if you want. Most of the time I do two. For this video, I'm just gonna leave it default so we can get through it a little bit quicker. But definitely consider enabling multiple probes. That will make it more accurate. Inverting steppers, a lot of times it's just easier to compile with the default settings and then adjust them after the fact. You can flip the motor cable over if your plug allows it. Like a lot of these I have DuPont connectors so I could just flip it. But on my log configuration, I usually go with the defaults. False, true, false. That's how I have the plugs configured so it works. Now on the extruder, it is flip-flopped. So I set E0 to true. Homing direction, all that is negative one because we home at zero on X, Y, and Z. Bed size, this one is 250 in the X, 210 in the Y. On mine, my minimum positions are outside of the bed. So I'm actually five millimeters out on the X, so I set that to a negative value. And then I am negative two in the front of the bed. So Y, so negative two. Then Z on log is somewhere around 200, maybe a little bit more but I don't use the leveling where I go to the top of the frame because the frame's not all that level. So we'll just leave it at 200, we should be good there. Next up, filament runout sensor, we do have one of those. So we'll want to uncomment this line. And the only thing I really need to change for this sensor is the state, because I'm using that sensor that Prusa uses. It's an optical sensor, it's one of the really small ones and those do trigger high. So we'll change it from low to high. Filament runout script, M600, that's the default. It's gonna work just fine. Then we get to bed leveling. We're just gonna stick with auto bed leveling by linear. Take the comment off of that. Since we have a steel sheet, we can just take the defaults for our probing pattern as well. I can get to all those locations. I don't have to map them out any longer. For now, we're just gonna take the three by three grid. That is nine point level. You can use as many as you wish. And I'm going to uncomment Z safe homing, but I really don't want to use it. And if you don't uncomment Z safe homing, it's going to throw an error. You can get around that because it's in a sanity check rule. You can just comment that line out. But if you use probing, it's going to bark about it. I don't need to use it because I can probe at 000 on the corner of the bed and not collide with anything. So we're going to fix that after the fact. We'll just take that error out. So we'll leave that off. Additional features, we will enable EEPROM, that is handy. That's so you can use commands to save settings in EEPROM. You don't have to actually reflash the firmware. 
and it will save them in between reboots. So we'll leave that enabled. We'll change up our temperatures to the ones that I like to use, PLA 215, bed 60, no fan, ABS 255, 100, no fan. And nowadays, if you want to add more, you can just add them underneath here. Just copy all these, change the name, change the setting, and they'll be available in your menu. Nozzle park, you have to have that to be able to use your filament runout sensor and that M600. You have to have a park location, so we'll take the comment off of that. And I like mine to park in the front right corner, so I do X maximum, negative 10, so that's all the way to the right, minus 10, and then Y, min, positive 10. So that's the bed all the way back towards the end stop plus 10. And then Z will take 20 wherever you're currently at. So we're good there. Then down in LCD settings, there's a couple of things I like to change up. First one being reverse encoder direction. I do like to do this. Most of these screens run in the opposite direction. I like it to go clockwise down, counterclockwise up. So that's why I reverse it here. We're going to turn the speaker on, speaker slash buzzer, so we do have audio. And going back up just a little bit because I missed it, but we do need to take the comment off of SD support, so we can use our SD card. Now we need to select our screen. Again, I have the 2004 display, which is the RipRap Discount Smart Controller. This one right here. And now we're all set with configuration.h, but there are some things in configuration underscore adv.h that we have to set. So we'll jump in there. So here in configuration underscore adv.h, there's just a couple of things that we need to configure. We need to configure those fans to be set correctly. I have to adjust some thermal settings and linear advance, but we don't have to deal with a whole lot in here. So let's just start scrolling through. The first thing we come to are the thermal runaway settings. There's a couple of different settings here. I've described these before. But on this printer, it's 12 volt and the bed heats really slowly. So you can hit thermal runaway really easily. So we want to adjust those. And there's two different settings. There's watch and then there's thermal protection. Watch is just if you enter a command and you're waiting for it to heat up. The thermal protection is during the print. So during the print, if it fluctuates tw two degrees one way or the other, within 20 seconds, it's going to throw thermal runaway. Again, mine's really slow, so I set mine to 90 seconds. And don't change these up if you don't know what you're doing, because this can save you from your printer burning down. But I use these settings all the time. We should be safe. And then watch, again, when you use commands. I usually increase these to 120 seconds from 60. That just gives it time, because again, this bed does heat really slowly. So that's, it has to change two degrees in two minutes. A setting that I've been using lately is hot end idle timeout. This is something you've started to see on a lot of 3D printers. If you preheat your nozzle and you let it set there, maybe you forget about it, this will shut it off in a certain amount of time, preventing the filament from charring inside the hot end. This can be really handy and it should probably be on every 3D printer nowadays. But the defaults are pretty good. It gives you five minutes to start printing, and the minimum trigger temp, 180 is usually fine. I'm always over 180, even if it's PLA. You can adjust these if you wish, but I recommend you go ahead and try to enable this on your printers. The next setting for this board that you might be interested in is use controller fan. Now, I don't have a controller fan, but printers like an Ender 3, there's a lot of them out there that have a fan on there by default. Since this board has three PWM fans that you can control in G-code, this might be a great use for it. You can set it up however you wish. If you want to adjust the pin, do it right here. I'm not using PB5 on this board, so that might be the one you want to use. And then you can set how it's triggered, as well as how long it spins, how fast it spins, all that good stuff. This can be really useful if you have your board inside a case tucked somewhere. Like my SK Go, it has a fan on the drivers. This might be a great use. So keep that in mind. For us, I plugged our hot end fan, E0, 
fan into PB6. Remember, PB7 is our part fan. So that will allow me to adjust what temperature that fan kicks on and what speed. I'm just gonna leave it default. 50 degrees on the hot end is fine, full blast. I want as much cooling as possible for that V6. If you need to know these pin assignments, you can check the pins file. So go over here to source, go down to pins, and again, you have an STM32F4. There's a lot of different boards, and there's usually always a common file. If there's multiple boards, like this one, there's a Rev A and Rev B. So if you check Rev B, the board we have, it's going to point you straight back to the common file. So we'll go to common. If you scroll through, you can get all the pin numbers. They should match up with the back of the board. And then here's your fans. So if you need a pin number, this is how you get them, or just go with the back of the board. Back to configuration underscore ADV.H. We should be good there for a hot end fan. We'll keep on going. Then I am using multiple Z steppers. So again, the Z stepper driver and the E1. So we're going to set it to two. We don't need to adjust the signals, but if you had a plug that was crisscrossed or something like that, you can adjust the direction for those motors right here. I find it just as easy to flip the cable over and I don't have multiple end stops. So that will allow us to use both of those Z motors. Moving on. I like to use G34. That's the main reason for those two motors. So we're gonna take the comment off of this line. This will allow us to use that G34 command and it uses the probe. Down here you can set up all kinds of attributes on this command set. I have a whole video on this. I'll leave it in the description. We'll move on for now. Come down to baby stepping. I do like to use this for my Z probe offset. So we're gonna take the comment off here. I like to enable double click for Z baby stepping. So you can click the knob twice and pull it up. That's only during a print. You can set that as well if you'd like. And I like to adjust the Z probe offset with that baby step setting. So we'll take the comment off here. So that way with a setup like this where you have a Z probe, you know that offset between prints. And you can go update EEPROM. To the next section, we have linear advance. I highly recommend you try to use this if you can. We'll take the comment off of linear advance. There's not much you need to set up here. I do like to set the K value to zero. I have lots of videos on how to use this. Links in the description. But this really does improve your print quality. So we want to use that for sure. Probe margins, if you need to set them, you can set them right here. Read the directions really carefully because that's going to tell you how those margins are affected. They're a little different than they used to be. And then the last thing we need to be worried about is advanced pause feature because we have to have this to use our filament runout sensor and our M600. These are all the attributes that you need to set up on how your filament's treated when it's being loaded or unloaded. The lengths, all that good stuff. I can go with defaults for now because it's not a huge issue, but you do want to tailor this to your hot end. It's most critical if you have a Bowden tube, how much you need to kick out to make this work. I do like to enable the filament load and unload G codes, 701 and 702. That way you can use them in your code. And then one more section if you want to take a look has trinamic. You can set up all your default currents here. Most of these don't need to be this high, around 800. It depends on your printer. Leave them default. If the motors are getting hot, then you can come and adjust it later. If you're using sensorless homing, all the settings are down here below. It's stealth chop by default. I don't have any problems with stealth chop, so I leave it that way. Make sure if you're using a different voltage, I'm using 12 volt, that chopper timing is set because that can help you with noise. So mine is on 12 volt. I do like to enable monitor driver status if you happen to need to troubleshoot something. We're not using sensorless homing, but TMC debug 
is always helpful. So we'll take the comment off of that. And we should be good. Everything else in the configuration should be set, default. We might have to tweak a few things later, but this should get us up and going on our SKR2. Now we need to build the firmware. And normally what I would do is go over here to the platform IO icon, and I would find the board that I was gonna build for. There is a slot for Big Tree Tech SKR2. Again, it is that four processor, the F4. But there's an environment for it. So if you expand, you can go ahead and hit build. You can't upload on these STM32 processors. You're gonna to have to take your firmware, put it on the SD card, all that good stuff. But there is a plugin for Marlin that takes some of the guesswork out of this. So we're gonna go ahead and install that now. We should really be using that going forward. We don't wanna guess because a lot of these boards are different. And because of that board setting, it's going to be able to tell you what board you need to use. So we're going to go to extensions, just search for Marlin, and auto build Marlin is the one you want. And just hit install. After the install is complete, you have your Marlin icon over here. And then you can go up here to the hammer icon. That's Marlin build. And it's going to read your configuration that you just created and select the proper board. If there's multiples, it will give you a choice, but this way you don't have to guess. Now we did have errors, but that was expected. Remember I was telling you about Z-Safe Homing. It's going to throw a sanity check error, and you can see it right here. It wants you to enable that because we have a probe. Again, I don't need to probe in the middle. I can probe on the corner, so I'm just gonna disable that sanity check. So back to the Explorer, after you have that error, it's going to highlight it in red, so it tells you where that error is. So it's in INC, sanitycheck.h. And we'll just control F and search for Z underscore safe. And this is the error we're throwing. I don't need to use it, so we're just going to make it a comment by putting two slashes in front of it. We commented it out. So then back to the Marlin extension, and we'll hit build again. And this time we are successful. So now we have a really good basic config. We need to get it over to the printer. Remember, STM32 processor, we can't upload it directly. So we need to hand truck that file over. Sneaker net. So the easiest way for me, go back to Explorer. And you're gonna have a .pio directory. Expand that and expand build. Then you should have one for your board or processor. Expand that one, and your firmware.bin is going to be right in here. Right click on that, reveal in File Explorer, there's your file. Right click and copy, and put it on an SD card. If you're having problems with your SD card, I highly suggest you format it fat. So right click on it, format. Just make sure it's a FAT or FAT32 file system and it should work. Quick format is just fine. Once it's formatted, we can right click, paste on our firmware.bin. Now we're ready to load that card on the board and power up with our new firmware. Now remember, we're just doing this Marlin install for this video. This board will run Marlin or RepRap firmware, but to get the most used out of RepRap, in my opinion, you're gonna need a Wi-Fi module. That way you can use the DWC and control this whole thing via a web browser. They do have those, I'll leave a link in the description, but grab one of those if you wanna run RepRap on it. So the install is pretty much done. We've tested a few things. Now we just need to do a test print. And there's our Benchy. This filament is Nebula Multicolor from Protopasta. If you want to check this stuff out, it's a really cool filament. My Benchy didn't come out the best, but it's really not the SKR board's fault. It's more Log's fault. 
I've got problems with my part cooling fan. My heater isn't as hot as it used to be. I need to switch it out. Again, log really just needs an overhaul. The benchy here really isn't going to tell you much about the board or anything like that anyway. It's just we want to prove that we did get a print. So there it is, the next generation of SKR board from Big Tree Tech, the SKR2. Now it does solve some issues that the 1.3 and 1.4 board had, and it offers a lot more features, especially since you have a lot more fan plugs. I like to see that so you can control them all. Again, I did have a lot of QC issues getting started, and the SKR2 launch was just a little bit rocky. But hopefully Big Tree Tech gets all that sorted out, things will get a whole lot more consistent going forward. Now, I didn't show every step of a board install in this video. Remember, you need to do a PID tune, uh, tune your extruder, calibrate your printer after you do a swap like this, because not every board is going to be the same. It's not going to run the MOSFETs, the heaters. It's not going to be the same across the board. So make sure you tune anytime you switch a board out. And I also said that you can run RipRap firmware and Marlin on this board. If you want to run RepRap, consider getting the Wi-Fi module with your order. Hopefully you found this helpful. That is it for today, and I'll see you really soon on the next one.